So good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a good long weekend. Um, I'm Nikki. I'm one of the liaison librarians at LHS. And today we will be going over the basics of critical appraisal. Um, this is meant to be an introduction and not an in-depth go through here. So what we're going to cover today is why this is important, some common misconceptions, four things that can explain every study finding, biases and confounders, what statistical significance means, and what to look for when you are um, doing an analysis. So as far as importance goes, so I hope everybody can see this okay. This is a screenshot. Um, so what happened was this study promoted four programs to health authority members to determine their willingness to fund a uh, mammography or cardiac rehabilitation program. So understandingly, like no government body wants to fund something unless they know it's going to work. And so they presented four programs. One was reduced rate of death. One was absolute reduction in death. One was rate of patient survival. And the last one was um, number needed to treat. So these were all different statistics based on the same study, but because they, they're all different numbers, it's commonly believed that these are very these are very different things. So if, if you understand critical appraisal, if you understand epidemiology statistics, this wouldn't fool you. So that's why it's really important to go into analysis because the papers that we write have the potential to drive policy. Um, so this is really important. As far as some misconceptions, and this, this is very general, I'm not pointing fingers at everybody, but a lot of people think that they know everything they need to know about critical appraisal. Um, they read scholarly papers. It's going to be, um, especially for say new residents, people that are going on clinical, like, oh, you're going to learn this in your training. Your mentor, your attending is going to teach it to you. And I wish that were true. But first of all, being able to read a scholarly paper and analyze it are very different. And it's generally assumed you already learned this somewhere else. And that's true for, unfortunately, a lot of clinical training. Another misconception is that since you read the primary literature, you know the studies are of good quality and can be trusted because they're in a peer-reviewed journal. They wouldn't publish it if it wasn't good, right? To prove a point, there have been some spoof articles sent to open access publishers. So articles that were on purpose shoddy. And a lot of times they get accepted because even though they say they peer review it, they're mostly just looking at the formatting and language and layout. Like, does it look professional? Does it sound professional? That kind of thing. Okay, so you'll stick to the journals that you know are good. This is all very logical. So this is out of New England Journal of Medicine, which I think we can all agree is a high impact, very well-respected, well-regarded journal. So they did this study on the effect, the effect of colonoscopy screening on risks, risks of colorectal cancer and related death. So does screening, does earlier screening make a difference was essentially the study. So in red here, I have, the difference is 0.28% versus 0.31%. That is not significant. And yet the, when it's reported out, previous studies show significant risk reductions. And colonoscopy offers small reduction in colon cancer risk. That is not, what this is saying is not what this is saying. 
it's not saying that the screening affects your cancer risk. It's saying that early screening doesn't make that much of a difference. And I guess, um, here's the information if you wanted to read the whole study, but you have to be able to understand what the results are telling you and not conflate the two. So another common misconception, and I apologize, I got started right away. If anybody has any questions, um, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, Rebecca is moderating the chat um, and she'll let me know about any questions. So I, I am sorry about that. I really just dove right in. Um, so another common misconception is if you use sites like UpToDate or Dynamed who aggregate the, the data for you, then that's going, to, then you're good. You don't need to appraise the evidence. So those sites are what we call tertiary literature, pri primary literature is I, I did the work, I wrote the study, secondary would be reviews and the tertiary is more like your textbook type stuff. Like this is known, this is not cutting edge. So those websites are tertiary. Um, they summarize the evidence. That doesn't mean they are evidence. And um, if you dig into them a little bit, there's quite a lot of conflict of interests and we, we could do whole papers on that. What I am basically saying is you cannot rely on others to have done the work for you. This is a skill you need to develop. Um, it's very easy to skew the truth with statistics. But if you know how to really read the methodology section, if you really know how to appraise an article, then you won't be fooled. So this is incredibly important. Any questions so far? Okay. So moving on, four things that explain every finding is truth, chance, bias, and confounding. Truth, well, that's what we're going for. Chance, we like to think that not too much is left up to chance, and that's why we have our confidence intervals, our p-values, statistical significance. That's all to make sure that our findings are due to research and not to chance. Biases and confounders, these are within our control. And we can't eliminate them, but we should do what we can to minimize them. So um, more on biases and confounders. Like I said, impossible to avoid, try to minimize. Um, can anybody, we only have a few people, so um, just shout it out. Can anybody tell me an example of a bias or a bias that you've often encountered? It can be one of these if you know more about one of these. Anybody? There's an implicit bias. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's implicit bias? I think it's when you're. Um... I think I would explain it like you're um, trying to, I guess you're, you're reading into something and you're applying what you're thinking, like, I, I'm trying to think of how, the, how to explain it. When I think of implicit bias, I think of um, more like you're in a store and somebody looks suspicious. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of implicit biases in there, but um, yeah, um, and the trouble with biases is a lot of times we don't know that we're doing them. And that's the trouble with them, but implicit bias is a good one. Um, I see something in there. Is there someone in the yes. chat? Um, selecting only favorable, uh, favorable reports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's confirmation bias. So yeah, um, really good. So Sampling bias is also known as um, selection bias, is, is especially in case control studies where the groups being compared are too different. 
like uh, an extreme example, just to drive home the point would be, um, let's say we're looking at hormone replacement therapy. So estrogen, progesterone, not like one of those. Um, and so we have our group of women who are testing this on because we wanna know about cancer risk. And our control is men because we know that they're not going to get the same kind of cancer as the women. I, those groups are too different because those men are never going to develop the cancer we're looking for. And you can't, it's, it's apples and oranges, essentially, is the trouble with sampling bias. Um, observation bias. And this is well, pretty self-explanatory, just participants in a study aware that they're being observed consciously or unconsciously um, alter their behavior or answers. Like they might know the answer that they or they think they're saying the answer you want you want or something of that effect or like you know somebody's looking at them through a glass so they might just behave other than they would normally. My attrition bias. Um, this is really important for um, especially prognostic studies. So if a bunch of people drop out for like let's say we're studying people with long COVID and a bunch of people drop out of the study and it's because they felt better. If you didn't take that into account, that's a bias. If people left just for various reasons all over the place, that's a different thing. But if they all left for the same reason, then you need to know what that is. Uh, Self-selection bias. That's decision to participate in a study is left entirely up to the individuals. So I always think of those uh, like nationwide polls where, okay, that's the opinion of people who are more likely to pick up the phone and actually answer all those questions. So if you called American households in the middle of the day, you're going to get the opinion of people who are either just live at home or... or everybody lives at home, um, either people who like, don't work or people who work from home, which is not generalizable to the entire country. So that would be self-selection bias. Um, recall bias is those are in retrospective studies. So it's like, oh, how many vegetables do you eat? Like, okay, what about last month? What about two months ago? Like, I don't know. I'm guessing. So we can't rely on people to recall specific areas of their life with any reliability, especially if you go further back. Confirmation bias. Um, this is more on the researcher end of things. So whether when researchers, this is conscious or unconscious, um, look for information or patterns in data that confirm their own beliefs. And then there's publication bias, which is studies with um, negative findings or confirming the null hypothesis are less likely to be submitted and less likely to be published. Any questions on biases? There's a few comments that came in. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, uh, was I think went back to what I think Shahida had put in a comment a couple minutes ago about selecting only favorable reports but put the opposite in or neglecting missing data mm -hmm. or unbalanced subpopulations. Then um, Ebony had written when asking about experiences it would seem that their experience with something like case management services are only effective in quotes when the uh, they put in effective in quotes, when the person has a good outcome. If the person didn't have a good health outcome, they will say the case management service wasn't good. Yeah, it's why I don't like patient satisfaction as a metric. <laughs> and then the last um, comment was from Dawn, co-founders are those variables that may distort the actual outcome you're studying or may get mixed effects. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, all great points. I was going to get to confounders. So Technically, it's a kind of bias, but it's one that can be dealt with in the analysis phase. So let's, um, Rebecca and I did a survey of nurses in the fall of 2020. 
that might have had a few confounders because in the fall of 2020, I don't think a whole lot of people were prioritizing our survey over dealing with working in a hospital in 2020 and having learned EPIC because that was released around the same time. So those were confounding variables. As long as you, um, it's important to identify confounding variables. Um, I came across this study. I can't believe it was published. Um, I, I wish I'd attached it to the PowerPoint. It was determining if hot showers um, were a factor in birth defects for like if pregnant women took hot showers, would did that result in a negative outcome for the for the baby? Which is not the most rigorous question for one thing. But also, if you're trying to ask a pregnant woman to remember how long and at what temperature her showers were, like we have recall bias, there's tons of confounders. And they didn't take any of those confounders into account. They looked at this super narrow thing. And also um, advice I give anybody who's going into OB is don't freak out the pregnant woman or the new mother. So it's just like, lots of confounders, lots of biases in there, like really like look into these studies and see how sound their methodology is. Okay, which leads us to statistical significance. So most of you, if not all of you have heard of p-value. So it's the probability of the difference in outcomes seen in a study could have occurred by chance alone, assuming there is no difference between the samples. So First of all, that's a big assumption, and we just talked about biases. But statistical significance is the lower the p-value, the so you want a tiny p-value. And it's generally the thing to have your p-value set as 0 0.05 or lower to make sure your results are statistically significant. We've all seen that in papers. However, so, oh, come on. It's not quite so straightforward. Um, if the study is poorly designed, the p-value is irrelevant. Like I said, the p-value assumes that your samples are otherwise similar. If you have small sample sizes, if you're measuring a lot of variables, if, like somebody said earlier, um, you're just looking at only part of the data, like, oh, we'll just, we won't look, talk about the, uh, the outliers, we'll only look at this cluster. Um, some people do tweak the data until they get results. And statistical significance doesn't equate to clinical significance. Like just because the numbers are significant, that doesn't mean it's going to have an impact on patients. And I can't believe this quote exists. Um, so this is from the executive director of the American Statistical Association. And he said, what statistical significance is supposed to mean is equivalent to what a right swipe on Tinder is supposed to mean. So it doesn't mean this is the best study ever. It just means, hey, let's keep looking at this. That's really all it means and we've kind of taken it and run. So that's really good to keep in mind when you're reading studies. Okay, so what do you look for? First of all, we need to talk about correlation or causation. And this is always a fun picture because I mean, obviously this is not causation or really stay away from that goose. So Bradford Hill, I think, he was a, I think he was a knight. I think it's like Sir Austin Bradford Hill, something to that effect. So he came up with this criteria back in 1965 for determining correlation or causation. So I can read this for yourself, but it's not so much a checklist. It's like, okay, let's just go through this and really analyze the paper for does it mention these things? 
based on what you know, like is does the association have strength? Is it consistent? Is it specific? So I like that we were like kind of fun to be able to reference a really old paper. Like, yep, that still holds up. Like we should really be looking into this kind of thing. And I went through a few, there's different checklists depending on if you're doing a randomized control trial, if you're doing a cohort, if you're doing case control, but they did have some things in common. So we can divide it up by study design or results. So the study design, we're looking at methodology. We're looking at recruitment. Like what's up, how were groups the same? How are they different? If, if we're doing an exposure, how is it measured? How is the outcome measured? And if it's a qualitative study, like you really got to pay attention to how it's measured because it needs to be, you need to find, can figure out a way to make something abstract measurable. And then when we're reading the results section, are the results well-defined? Is there anything else that could explain the results? Like going back to the pregnant women in showers, like there's a whole bunch of other things that could explain like, why are we focusing on showers? And then can re result be applied to the general population? This one's kind of slippery because if we're looking at people with long COVID, we're not saying the whole of the population, we're saying the population of people who have long COVID. So can it be applied to the greater population of that type of patient? And then implications for practice, there should be some. And they should be doable. So some takeaways. Um, don't assume somebody else rigorously went through the article. Check for yourself. You can eliminate biases and confounders. Statistically and clinically significant or different, correlation causation, and use a checklist. Um, the checklists I really like, and I have these in my references, um, are the CASP ones, C-A-S-P. They have a checklist for several different study types. Um, critical appraisal skills program, and they're publicly available. You can just Google them. Um, but that is my presentation. And does anybody have any questions? <laughs>